And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple, coming to us all the way from Dark World Studios, the creators of the upcoming game Acheron. In one corner, we have Joe Hunter, and the other corn we, corner, we have the one and only Travis Cumming, a.k.a. Dr. Cumming. Yes, yes, I had to, I had to pause because, there, because I'm pretty sure there's some people with bad taste and humor in, in the audience. Um, but how, how are you two doing today? Doing great. Well, I wouldn't say I taste bad, but pretty yeah, alright. You also have people with bad taste in the uh, in the interview, so <laughs> sorry about that. Phrasing, boom. Mm. Um, <laughs> so it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. And with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick? So. Um, funny enough, the first time I was introduced to role-playing games was actually through Joe. Um, we went to high school together, and he invited me over for a campaign he was ready to um, DM. And uh, we had a fantastic first game, and then he dropped it immediately thereafter. And so I felt compelled in order to get my fix to start DMing and more people wanted me to DM and then I was just stuck in the role for the last like eight years now. So supply and demand. And also I just love storytelling in general. Mm -hmm. I want to defend myself because <laughs> I, I planned that campaign and wrote a binder full of notes. And as my first time doing a campaign, I did not understand the whores players can inflict upon a world where you put cats in it. So <laughs> just, I'm just going to go out of limb and say, <laughs> was it, wasn't my fault uh, that Travis got railroad into being a DM for all these years. But my first experience was fairly classic. I got invited with a couple of friends over to a mutual friend's house. Um, we all did our game zero made characters for Pathfinder at the time. Mm -hmm. And we're all in a magic school doing a bunch of lowly tasks to get magical training to do more and more adventures. So a pretty, pretty classic at, at this point in my life, I would say more, um, I don't want to say boring because that's not exactly, exactly right. Cause I, I like that setup, but a more, a more restricted, more restricted setting for sure. And then that died down. I tried to DM a game in which someone not Travis decided to, make a cat explode uh, by filling it with water. And after that, I realized I was not prepared <laughs> to step into the DM seat. So a lot of, um, a lot of cat related incidents. There seems to be a th seems to be a theme with you guys. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a handful of horror stories that has to do with, cats but i don't know why um the people from our hometown has such a uh, anger towards them i i suppose is it like how but there was I guess a bunch that's of what happens when... but is there a bunch of cat Sorry, ladies in your area or something you could say that yeah um yeah you could say that i don't know <laughs> That that's a deep rabbit hole. <laughs> um, oh. About our small town, but well, it's not like it's not like I'm one to talk when it comes to 
being from some sort being from some sort of small town. Now, um, when it comes to At- when it comes to Acheron, which as I as I understand, you guys are leaning more in the direction of dark fantasy than anything else. Um, possibly a little bit of sword. Would you say that you would you say that Acheron leads more into dark fantasy or sword and sorcery? Definitely dark fantasy, one hundred percent. We can we can definitely dive into this deeper later. I know Travis has a lot to say about this subject as well, but the sword and sorcery, at least for me, is always more of like the high fantasy. Everything is good for the most part all the time, and that is definitely not the direction that we are going. Mm-hmm. Oh. I feel like um, the binary between like dark fantasy and uh, sword and sorcery is that um, with uh, sword and sorcery, it is a the themes that you really go down are uh, all, like usually good against evil or neutral against lesser evil or neutral versus neutral. There's not really um thematically there is like a lot of like honestly like a lot of people do want to be like their own heroes and their own stories but with more of like the modern day like role player the uh there's like dms and um players alike like more of neutral and grittier tones and that's basically what we're trying to go for with our setting, um, most definitely. Which, it, that's right. That description strikes me as a bit odd because um, I I think there's been some conflation between sword and sorcery and um, high fantasy. Because what you're what you what you just described is more of high fantasy. Where to put things in perspective, um, something like Conan. Is considered sword and sorcery instead of um, high fantasy. Ah, uh, <laughs> very, 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 very. I, I didn't mean I didn't mean to come off as pedantic with with that. It's just the, it was just the way you were describing sword and sorcery. I'm like, that doesn't sound like Conan. That doesn't sound like Cull. That doesn't sound. That's that certainly doesn't sound sound like Fathford and the Gray Mauser. So I was like, yeah. So I I was confused for a second. Um. But the but um, taking that taking that into into account and running with it, what would you what would you say were was the um seed that prompted the creation of Atron? Was it a case of a um Pathfinder or D and D game that just um got that just got out of hand, or was there a different route? Um, so um, how like. I kind of started um, writing Acheron at, uh, before, like my kind of friend group started to um, mold it to their own kind of desires. Was uh, we wanted to play a uh, Call of Cthulhu game? We wanted a darker, grittier setting, um, and I couldn't find any books that ran it in a D twenty system. So we, um, so I basically started converting it. And as I was converting it, I was looking at like, it was a very old, like an older edition. Mm-hmm. So I was basically wanted something more. And I was consuming a lot of media around that time, like the old, uh, like not the old, but the first Dishonored game and some other stuff like that. So that definitely had a influence in the setting and how the world is set up. But it has mostly taken on a life of its own since then. And one of the main things that I did that I did notice with um with the with the system as far as it was presented is the is the fact that you don't real is the fact that one um a lot of it is point based and two 
you're not really do you're not really doing um you've cer you certainly got some archetype kind of a kind of effects with backgrounds but you're not really doing um classes even though this is using a d20 base yeah um like uh we wanted people to be able to do whatever they wanted to do because like um when I first started um, DMing, like someone's like, why can't I do this? And I'm like, well, that's like constricted by your class or what have you. And um, multi-classing was just very complicated. So I was looking at some um, other systems, but like basically how this point by kind of developed was just, um, just uh, chugging along and trying to find the uh, most optimal way for someone to make basically whatever they wanted, mm -hmm. you know, without it being too complicated. So if they wanted to be um, a blind gunslinger or Indiana Jones or Sherlock Holmes, they could. Let's see, a, bl a blind gunslinger. Do you have anything? Yeah. Sorry, go on. I was just saying, I think I think of that, and all I can think of is what would happen if Z if Zatoichi was ever adapted to the West. <laughs> I I'm afraid I don't get that reference. Zatoichi, the um the blind swordsman. Didn't really. <laughs> that... Furious oh. typing in the background. Yeah, the sorry, I'm, tra I'm trying but to I'm find trying out this reference. Anything. It's. Yeah, I am. Um, if I made it, if I made it clear that I lit that I live and die within libraries by this point. <laughs> mm hmm. Right off the bat. This, okay. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, wow. I didn't realize how, how many years Zada, Zadaichi, Zadaichi mm -hmm. has been around and is still going. I'm surprised I've never heard about that. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to figure out what that was. Now, one of the other, one of the one of the other things that I couldn't that I couldn't tell, but um, but no, but note is your do is your you guys are you guys were doing a point based setup while doing leveling at the same time. Um, was there was that the was that the plan from the get go, or were there attempts to go full freeform early on, but it di but balancing didn't work out? Um, I mean, unless Joe, do you want to tackle this? Uh, I I'm yeah, I'll tackle this one. So originally, we played around a lot with point values and how much you got per level. What could you buy for that? And um, at one point, we had different points for each main stat. So you had like strength and dex, and you could get points in those, but not other things. So it, it went from, from very simple to very complicated back to where it is now after a lot of just trial and error, trying to balance everything and make sure people still had that freedom without being overwhelmed by needlessly complex systems. And the other thing I'll touch on real quick is one of the things we're trying to do because we know everyone homebrews any system they get their hands on pretty much in some way or another is looking at different ways that we think people will homebrew. So one of the things we have a section on is um, sort of like difficulty modifiers mm -hmm. and suggested changes. So uh, one thing is that the points don't need to be given out 
on quote unquote leveling up. You could, if you're a GM that really likes doing things based on story beats in, instead of waiting to give a level at the end of a story arc, uh, like we would typically do, you could say, if you have some major story beats planned out or just want people to be able to get points every single session, you can just give a point each session or each story beat or do it from a actual jump level point of view. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes, now when one of the things that I what that I was um, that I will admit I was I was curious about is the fact that when it comes to merits and flaws. Um, now I know that I know that both both are kind of capped on um, at not at nine each, but whenever there's a positive negative um, advantage system within a game, there's always the risk for min maxing. Has that has that been something that's hap that's um happened during testing? Um, we absolutely expect you to mid max <laughs> to survive in this game like it's not like the like more casual players will definitely be able to play but basically because of um how we have like some of the uh gm setting uh like uh recommendations and stuff you can basically adjust to how well your characters or players have mid-maxed their character. Like, I feel like a big problem is when you are, um, uh, like, let's say D&D, for instance, where someone has really mid-maxed their character by taking, like, the optimal race and then the optimal class, subclass, and then all the feats and stuff. Like, um, that is, like, kind of hard to deal with. But in our world, everything is still extremely deadly, regardless of what level you are. Um, and that, because it is primarily a horror setting, it will constantly keep your players on their toes, you know? Because um, the max health is around... Uh, 25, 27, mm -hmm. if you really mid-max your character from our point of view. Um, I don't know if someone's going to be able to um, break our rules due to our language in such a way to get, like, um, 30, but it's still going to be within that. And because there's guns in the world, and um, a 9 millimeter does a D10 worth of damage. So a lot of the characters and most characters average six health are going to die very easily if you know they're not if they are out of place you know if that makes sense mm -hmm. like the world is still incredibly deadly so i think our balancing is based on making the world just as deadly as the players can be and i'll add on to that real quick so there was one game we played where someone, I think, uh, had 16 total health. They were a constitution-based build, so they were high health and then melee combat focused. But outside of that, they didn't really have any abilities. Um, so any social situation, they're going to be pretty crippled in. So if, if you want a min-max in one area, you really can. So if you want to be the very specific i am the talker for this group you put a gun in my hand and i'm almost completely useless you can do that very well but at the same time you might not be able to drive a car or you know nothing about the occult so if someone walks up to you and casts a spell in your face you go i don't know what just happened i just fell asleep and now i woke up and i'm in cuffs so there's a lot of of balance from a point of view of there's always trump cards. 
that you can play as a as a GM on different types of builds. So the there is always a separation sort of between the combat aspects and the role play aspects as far as uh like doing persuasion and stuff like that so that's one way that it's balanced so if someone's combat focused they're going to lose out there but you can also just make someone who's fairly good at a handful of things and because of the deadly nature of the game you're not going to feel useless in combat and you're also not going to feel useless in other role play avenues like other people might Now, with that, with that in mind, with that in um, in mind, one one particular aspect that I was cu- that I was curious about because this is something that's often tricky for a lot of designers to balance that you've kind of touched into, and that is the inclusion of both psych- of both um psychics and um mana mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. for more traditional magic and um. Now, narr- now, narratively, how- the question is that the question I have is how are they separated from each other, and mechanically, um, where's where's the line between the two of them in case somebody was going to expand on either of them? So, what what, what sort of feels would lean more towards psychic? What toward, what sort of feels would lean toward, more towards magic? Um, so, uh, when we first started. Um, putting like pen to paper and writing stuff down. Um, I originally didn't want to have uh, traditional magic in this world at all. Um, But then basically it's um, for which one you really want to go with is like a, how constrictive you want to like, playing your own game essentially like because psychic powers um which we call um mancies because you know pyromancy um neuromancy necromancy all of that um you know are psychic related abilities and they are very um open-ended they are a hammer that you can, if you think the world is a nail, hammer on with just about anything. Um, Role play, combat, there's something for everybody with um, mancies. But thematically, people are born mancers or they're just awaken as mancers, kind of like the traditional sorcerer archetype in D&D or Pathfinder or other D20 systems like that. Um, But um, magic uh, is more based on ritual and tradition and belief. So because most the magic works because more people believe it works. So you do A, B, and C, and it equals E, um, which means electric eels, and you throw electric eels at people, but like um, magic is um, more traditional than um, uh, modern day uh, role playing games because the mana system is different for each magic because I wanted each domain to feel different. Mm -hmm. I wanted each um, domain to, instead of like in other games where you're like, this is illusions, but you're a wizard of like destruction, but you're like, oh, I like this illusion. So I guess I'll pick that. That um, cross like hybridization is harder in our game, but each domain of magic is its own thing. Like it has its own feel to it and it has its own like mana pool and the things you can do with it is very different from each one. So with the hammer metaphor, magic is a bag full of tools. You know, like you might not be able to use the pair of pliers for this, but it is useful for a plethora of other things. Mm -hmm. 
but you have to, um, unlike the Mancer, you have to learn magic. You have to um, do some book learning, as they say nowadays. Yep. Now, when it comes now, something that I did notice is when it comes to um, when it comes to the Mancies is is how with, at each level there's multiple um, there's multiple effects. Now, is it a is it a case is it a case like a spell list in Rollmaster where you pit where you learn pyromancy and and then learn the level one version, then two, then then three, or is it a case where you'd have to bu you would have to buy each of those um each of those effects individually? Um. No, so when you purchase a level of Mancy, you get access to all of those abilities that it describes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but you don't, like, um, thematically, your character uh, doesn't, like, go to a um, master of pyromancy and he goes, well, let me teach you how to um, shoot fire better. Um, no, it's more like you're a martial artist or a um, dancer or something of a more physical discipline. And because you keep working at it and practicing, that's when it starts to click and that's when you are able to have, you know, more fire. But like mechanically, you just buy the next level. Mm -hmm. I, if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, and obviously some of them are going to be harder to, to go to go into, but it's it sounds like um now maybe maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong on this, but it sounds like when it comes to mancies that it, that that you're that you're tra you're trading usability for versatility, i.e. mages are mages are going to have more options available to available to them, but um. That, but there's a bigger invet but there's a much bigger investment comparatively speaking. I would say that that's pretty accurate. Um, I think Travis was on point with his with magic. It's a bag full of different tools, and with the Mancies is one tool that can be used for most things. If you can fit most things into being a nail in your own narrative of how problems should be handled so like a pyromancer is pretty much only good at burning things down being a pyromancer doesn't help you talk your way into a bank vault whereas with some of the different spells from all the domains of magic you can still burn a house down but you can also maybe get an edge in a conversation all right i can get i can um i can go with that now, when it come, now um, it's funny. It's funny to me that you that you mentioned um, Call of Cthulhu as one as one of the as one of the early notations because a lot of the framework that I'm seeing out of Acheron has a very D twenty feel to it. Um, not not necessarily of a one for one comparison, but more of the DNA of D20. Um, so I'm, cu I'm curious, for, I'm curious as to the reasoning behind that, especially since obviously Call of Cthulhu is using a, um, using a whole different die system than, than what you guys are using. Travis, you're on. Yeah, um, so, uh, the DNA is like um, we're trying our hardest to make a different D20 system, but um, a lot of the framework, um, like like um, what is it? Uh, what is the word I'm trying to look for? Um, mindset of uh, a D20 system is definitely ingrained with it because we want people to. 
um, be familiar with our um, with the system before they kind of before they even pick it up. Um, but um, it's basically we had to make our framework um, approachable by more people than um, systems like Call of Cthulhu. Uh, we try to streamline a lot of things. That's why we have a hybrid point by leveling system mm -hmm. because um, I feel like that's more approachable of a point by system than most other point by systems like GURPS or um, uh, Shadowrun, you know? Um, so it's more easy to comprehend what is going on. And one of the main reasons why we kept the leveling system is so your skills kind of level up passively instead of most point buy systems where you have to invest a lot of points to be a sweet talker. We really wanted the person who is like, oh, I'm gonna dump most of my points into um, fighting real good. Um, to being able to talk or craft or whatever secondary thing that they wanted their character to do without um, without subtracting a lot of the essence of the character they wanted to play. Um, like, uh, what's the character I'm trying to... Like uh, Ash from Evil Dead. Like he's a chainsaw wielding, gun wielding, smooth talker. Well, not smooth talker, but charismatic fellow. Mm -hmm. So we wanted that to be ac accessible, um, easier for players. Sorry um, if I went on a rant, r tangent there. No, no worries, man. Now... When it comes now, um, when it comes to when it comes to uh, com when it comes to combat, um, since you mentioned, given the HP pool you mentioned, would it be fair to say that you're aiming for the lethal side of combat without having to deal with something like, say, wound tables? So, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I will say though, it's. It's interesting that you brought up wound tables uh, because while the combat is super deadly, and I don't know if you're going to touch about on this in a minute or not, we we did in the early days run into issues with because it is a D20 system and has a higher level of randomness than something like uh, a D6, like a 3D6 base mm -hmm. system. Sometimes people just you roll in that one and you have a grenade in your hand and it falls at your feet and you roll in that one and that grenade goes off and suddenly you go from being full health to even though you have on a flak jacket, you're at negative six and everyone around you is also hurting. So we had to figure out a way to make sure players don't feel cheated in those situations while still making sure that you're the one that decided to bring grenades to a gunfight. So if something goes really bad, it is also still a little bit on you. And that's where the diehard system came in. And I think Travis has more to say on how all that started because he's the one that implemented it. Mm -hmm. um, so the diehard system is uh, loosely based off of a um, old rule set of the fate system. But um, Fate System is way more uh, thematic and uh, loose, and we can't really... Um, so we gave it a little bit more structure, and I think I gave it a little bit more fairness to it. Because when something goes wrong, like you take... Um, so let's um, have a theoretical scenario of you have six health, guy with nine millimeter shoots you, um, and roll six and you only have six health, um, instead of taking that damage, you can choose to take a permanent flaw, like losing a limb, um, uh, half a lung, 
or uh, something of that nature. So you don't lose that health, but you now are um, changed um, forever, essentially. So um, basically, when you go into combat is, what am I willing to lose for this character in order for them to keep going? So as the player, you're kind of their will to survive <laughs> on like when you essentially call it quits for your character. Now, if you are um, a um, guy who threw a grenade at his feet and you're in a firework factory right next to a gun shop mm -hmm. and everything explodes, you're probably still dead. You won't be able to say, oh no, I just lost a leg during that whole thing. But um, it doesn't, it gives you a level of survivability without um, completely breaking the game. Yeah. And give, given, the, given the fact that D20 is the die of choice here, I'm guessing, I'm guessing there's the, I'm guessing there's the mindset at play that having Having um crit having um cr criticals in the same in this in the traditional way might be a little bit too punishing. Indeed, like um, I mean, I think the advantage of a D twenty system is the critical failure and success, um, because a lot of other systems it is. Um, like, oh, you rolled five sixes, you know? Instead, it's such a disparity between uh, when you roll a d20 because anything can happen. And I really enjoy that level of randomness. Um, but uh, in this game, so often in the early days, uh, someone with a um, pea shooter shot uh, so-and-so, uh, rolled a nat 20 and that character was just gone out of the face of the earth. And they're like, I have 10 levels in this guy and he's just gone. So we thought that was a little bit too punishing. Thus the die hard system was implemented. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the other things that we, have changed to sort of deal with that is in a lot of games, especially Pathfinder, you can do crit builds that have a crit range of, I think it could go all the way down from anywhere between 14 and 20 if you really min-maxed it. And we don't have that. There's very few things that can make it so anything other than a natural 20 actually crits. So you aren't dealing with the fact of you're taking two or three times damage or dealing two or three times damage on 25% of your rolls. It's only that 5%. Um, following through on the whole, on the crit question, um, do you get, do you get, what do you guys think of the whole confirmation rule thing that Pathfinder does? Well, Pathfinder and D&D &D do. Um, we got rid of it. I mean, not rid of it, but we uh, we don't have it in our game mm -hmm. um, because uh, the main reason, like one of the main early reasons why we wanted combat to be so deadly was so that it would be quick. Um, personally, like, I, I don't think Acheron is going to be one of those games where uh, combat is uh, something that is the... Uh, storyteller's default like go um, fight those kobolds on the outskirts of town or go uh, murder those uh, thugs uh, on the outskirts of town or what have you uh, combat we wanted it to feel like more of a last resort or a monumental thing uh, when you were thinking about doing something because of how uh, deadly the world like to that's why we made the world so deadly mm -hmm. um, because a 
person with a sawed off shotgun, even though they don't really know how to use it, if they hit you, you are probably going to die um, if you are within like 10 feet of them. So we wanted like that level of um, spontaneity and deadliness. Um, ah, oh, geez, I went on a tangent again. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, Every, everybody goes on. T everybody goes on their own tangents here. So, um, and when it comes now, when it comes to the, when it comes to that, um, now obviously pa Pathfinder has had the optional rule of th of things like a um, things like a hero point or or the like. Has was there ever, was there ever any thought to putting something similar within Acheron? I don't, not to, not to my memory. Um, I'm not familiar with that mechanic. What, uh, what does it do? Um, it's, it's one of those things that varies from interpretation to interpretation, but there's, but it's more often used as a, as a kind of last resort do over, do over, but you're only going to get a certain amount of them. Like maybe, maybe at most, Three over the course of an entire session. I mean, I would say that the Die Hard system is kind of a soft version of that, um, because if you if you choose to, you can completely uh, RoboCop this and choose to have all of your limbs blown off and replaced with. Um, uh, soul metal and then become a soul metal RoboCop if you really wanted to. But um, yeah, we don't have any major systems like that. No. All right. Now, when it now um, one of the thing when it comes to something when it comes to something like psychics and. And uh, and more and um, more specifically, when it comes to something like sanity, there's oh, I've seen plenty of Call of Cthulhu games where that's something that ends up getting abused in some on some levels. Um, what what you what sort of pillars have you had with the design with your take on um sanity? In terms well, of what um, you wanted to emphasize and what you wanted to avoid. So um, a big thing about uh, sanity that I've seen in um, other games that have it um, are that it's used as a big carrot. I mean, as a big stick in the carrot and stick thing where um, a DM uh, or storyteller just goes, oh, I didn't really want you to do that. So... Uh, here's a sanity pel penalty. And then um, equally, I see that when you are playing a horror-based game and um, there's a lot of uh, moral questions involved, that it's not really used for anything like that, only when the monster hops out the closet. So with this, our sanity system is based upon three pillars. Um, there is, each character will have this uniquely, but there is uh, how your character responds to violence, to the supernatural, and to morality. Mm -hmm. So if your character, if you want to play the character who is squeamish around uh, drugs and sex, you can have a um, high morality score so that when you see that, you're less likely to succeed against sanity brought upon uh, very taboo things. Equally, um, if you want to play uh, Samuel Jackson in uh, The Kingsman, who can't stand the sight of blood, you can make your character very squeamish around violence. And uh, if you want to play Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, you can make it really low versus supernatural things. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
basically we try to make it more dynamic and easier to digest um, as sanity systems go. Yep. Now, when it comes... Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the setting, one thing that I noticed with the um, art is that some of the art leaned a little bit more into fantasy, and some of it leaned a little bit more into um, more con more contemporary um, approaches. And give and given the especially given the uh, list of backgrounds within the within the um, alpha. Um, where where do we, where would you say that Acheron's technology level is? Joe, would you like to? Yeah, yeah, I can I can I can take on this one. So the the general time period is 1930s. So um, going a little bit into the lore, we won't go down this rabbit hole too far, but mm -hmm. we are in a world that used to be more techno technologically advanced. And then an event known as the breach happened, unleashed whores, empowered magic, and sort of destroyed the old world. And after that destruction, we are now 233 years into rebuilding, reworking all of society um, and that leaves us at about 1930s level. So you got cars, you got trains, you've got guns. You don't have anything like cell phones, though. Um, and we are a little bit uh, fluid around that time. So if there's something that for us just really makes sense from a uh, more of a contemporary player convenience perspective, like uh, phone lines being in every home, then that is something we sort of leave vague so people can do essentially whatever they, they want as a GM, adding in a little bit of the more technology, less technology slider, if that makes sense. All right, I can, I can, go, I can go with that. And... and... When it come when it comes to that kind of slider, um, how is that how is that going to be how is that going to be balanced out, um, so that so that you so that you don't have too much of a gap between technology levels. Um, so um, when you look at our um, map, uh, the central districts are the closest districts to uh, District One. Mm -hmm. um, at the dead center is going to be more technologically advanced. Um, as you go out there, you uh, start going further down on the slider. Um, people in more frontier lands um, on the outer edges are going to have less technology. Um, and that's where you get more of the uh, cowboys or um, almost half medieval backwaters out in the swamp who are currently being plagued by a werewolf or cultists. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how the slider is set up. And as for, a general guideline. And, and for a lot of these things, just in general in Akron, it, it is drawn from real life so my dad had a good story of him being a, a kid probably around eight so this is the late 1950s and he lived on a farm in semi-rural colorado and they finally got plumbing when he was around eight years old so it's i think it's unthinkable for some people in the modern day to uh look at a a house out in the prairie and think it doesn't have electricity and running water, but those were very real things. So that's, that's kind of what we're working with. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason that slider exists. And I can, I can definitely see that it's one of the, it's one of those things where when, when you're dealing with different um, technology levels, there can, there can be a whole lot of um, legwork invo involved. 
some some games do a whole a whole numbered um, tech level system. Some don't. Some don't. It ultimately depends on who on who's on who's running the ship. Um. Now, one of the th- one of the things I was curious about when it comes to character creation, going in, going into that for a moment, is the notion of um p- of picking your skills and that and those are the skills that you can only develop in. Um. I get I get the sense that that's kind of the game's answer to to class skills, but when you but um. Is that is that whole? You can only develop in these skills something that applies only at character creation or throughout a character's whole career. Um, so we do have the option that if, um, for instance, uh, your character really needs to start developing athletics to start swimming away from <laughs> abominations in the water or something mm-hmm. of that nature, um, you can. Uh, you passively gain ranks every level. So if you want to um, get a skill that is outside of your original repertoire, it requires two ranks instead of one. So it's just a double cost. Um, So basically that encourages those first skills are very important to... uh, to what your character is going to be doing for the rest of their campaign, but it doesn't shoehorn you completely in uh, not being able to do. Welcome back. Yep. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Discord decided to um, derp. Um, I get that sometimes. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the now, as a kind of capstone, um, obviously you guys have ha- you guys have had the alpha out for a bit of time. Um, what? How do you see? How do you see this thing developing? Do you are you planning on br- on bringing this to crowdfunding some sometime down the line, or is it a case of just developing internally and then putting out a full release? Um. So we are actually going to have a Kickstarter for this. Um, October first. For um, you and the people back at home, mm-hmm. um, if you want to support this, um, we uh, have a lot more already written. Um, it's just uh, this is the stuff that we've released to uh, that we feel comfortable with everybody being able to see what we have. Um, but there is a lot more to come. Uh, we have seven different Mancies than the two shown, and they go through one through five on their levels. And we also have um, seven domains of magic. So five there's a lot of domains of magic. What? Mm-hmm. Five domains of magic, not oh, seven. Sorry, I was. Never mind. I was thinking of the. Uh, never mind. No. Um, yeah, we're going to be releasing those five um, uh, schools of domains of magic and possibly seven if we uh, get enough funding uh, down the road. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's um, a lot more than just this sampler for our game. Mm-hmm. And we would like um, as many people to see it if we get funded. And I'll... I'll certainly be look. I'll certainly be looking forward to how to how that um, shakes out. Um, now, with now, when it comes to that, would you would you say that the page size that you're shooting for is going to be around two hundred? 
So we're we're trying to deliver one complete experience in a book. So D and D and other systems like to break things up for I'm sure financial reasons into multiple books. Like uh, usually there's the player's guide, there's the GM guide, and then there's the bestiary. And we're trying to have everything good to go in one whole book. So we're looking at probably um, right now uh, out of all the written pages, I think we're sitting at 300, 320. And by the time we put in all the extra lore and add a couple more monsters to the beast area, we're probably going to be looking around 350, 400 when it's all condensed, edited, and all the tables are much smaller than they are right now and all mm-hmm. that. So it's a, it's a hefty tome. All right. Well, given the fact that you have to introduce a lot of stuff, and the least of which being the setting that is going to be taking place, I'd say having having this lean on the beefier end of things was always going to be inevitable. Mm-hmm. But and you 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 said that that that'll be go that'll be going up in in October and um. Are you planning on running that one for about 30 days? Um, yeah, we were thinking about going throughout the month of um, October because it is a horror game, and why not use the spookiest month of the year? All right. Well, it it is the year with the pagan holiday where it is completely and utterly legal for me to scare the shit out of people. The best holiday. Yeah, and even if some people get mad at me for for the for the whole tr- for the whole tricking people into eating sugar free candy. Ah, uh, that's that's almost war crime level. <laughs> Look, I can't look. I can't have cho- I can't have chocolate, so this is my way of getting revenge. <laughs> Cursed without having chocolate. Yeah, and you Jeez. Yeah. It's, <laughs> if I have to suffer, then so does everybody else. Who did you curse in a past life to have such a <laughs> hefty flaw <laughs> i have no idea i must it it must have been it must have been something very very heinous for me to have that for me to have this affliction but hmm. now one of the now one thing that's become kind of a hallmark of a lot of um development and I'm, cu- I'm curious if this is something that's been considered, even though I know it'd probably be low priority at this juncture. When it comes to the character sheets, now assume assume, and I'm I'm not even going on the assumption that they're going to look like they currently do. Are you guys plan? Are you guys planning on putting out character sheets that are form fillable? Yeah, they they yeah. exist right now, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, we are um, currently trying to make them like um, the kicks, uh, the character sheets we have out now are um, uh, pretty fantastic from our um, one of our in-house artists, uh, Michelle Marvin. But um, she is never satisfied with it. And um, there will definitely be tweaks in the future. Um, we do have a fillable one, and we should probably put that on the site once it's finished. But we're still working out um, some of the auto fill um, abilities of it, where it calculates your modifier and stuff like that. All right, I got gotcha. you. And to the, I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how that kind, how that kind of thing um, pans out. And the and of course and every and all the other shenanigans that come along with it. Um, with that in, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and 
enjoy the uh, madness that happens here in the temple. Thank you. This was this was honestly everything I hoped that it would be. <laughs> um, very nice and relaxed. My anxiety coming in was low and stayed low the whole way through. So thanks for reaching out and thanks for having us and keep doing awesome work. Yep. And of, of course, anytime, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, wonderful. I, I thought this was a dry, dry state, but uh, if I ever go through the door next time, I will definitely bring an adult beverage. <laughs> oh, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>